Well, good morning and welcome to worship here at Cross Lutheran Church. Um, a beautiful day, which followed, I believe, a beautiful day as yesterday we gathered as community to commend to God the soul of Daryl Anderson. And for those of you who are here, thank you for supporting the family and thank you for coming on your own um, because I know you had deep relationships with the Anderson family and um, this is what church is about at the beginning and the ending of life and to carry on those memories and to remember that God is in the midst of it all. Sylvia, Sylvia Graham has an announcement. Could you come up and give us your announcement, Sylvia? Uh, we are going back to John Glenn Middle School on September 29th. And we're going to go back to the walk-in distribution. The time has changed. We're going to be 2.30 to 5. And I can tell you after going on a tour that John Glenn is ever-changing. So what we do this month, we may not be doing <laughs> next month. But I do want to make you aware of some of the changes and ask for volunteers because we will need volunteers now starting at 1 o'clock. Um, th this, this is going to be just after school starts, so the teachers are not going to be able to help us until after 2 o'clock, and we won't have the students except the students will be there to help with taking some of the food to the cars, cars with the families. So, our delivery is at 1 o'clock, half an hour window either way. Um, and, you know, we're going to be real close to the lunch hour, get, just getting cleaned up after lunch, and we're going to be serving at 2.30. So, and there's going to be lifting and carrying, and depending on how close we can get the pallets to the distribution site, which will be in the temporary cafeteria. Um, hopefully we will be able to have some two-wheelers so we can stack up some of this stuff and get it moved in. Um, we'll be using the cafeteria tables. There will not be any extra chairs, and I know some of you prefer to sit on the chairs. Um, the other thing that will be different is you will be doing your own inventory. Be again, because we've got time constraints. So as we get the food to the tables, you will have to take the inventory, how many cases you have, and you'll have to do the end inventory. I know this is a pain, but this, I need to let this, the Merrick know how many pounds of food we have distributed. And so the pounds of food we've distributed, the number of people that have come, and the different the categories of, of families, how many people are in the families. This is how they get their funding. And this funding is what keeps us alive. So yeah, some of that is not fun. The larger families, again, this year, we will do a check-in, as we did last year, the larger families will get a little slip, probably a red slip, and as they go around the tables, they will know that, you will know that they can have uh, possibly double of what is there. Okay. After all that, volunteers, the one thing that's not going to change, it for sure, is we will this year be serving from 2.30 till 5 the whole time. Mm -hmm. um, You will park at the entrance, uh, main entrance, where you've always parked before. But the main entrance isn't opened. So you will go directly to the left, which says activity door. You will go in there. There's a very nice person sitting there who knows to, that all you have to do is to tell her, we're from Cross Lutheran Church and we're here for the community market. She will let you in, send you down the hall, which is a long hall, um, 
if you're lucky, you'll be able to see the brand new swimming pool, which is gorgeous. If my tour was right, we will go by that, okay? <laughs> um, so all I can say is I need volunteers. There may be a lot of lifting. It's going to be different. We have no, have any, no idea how many people we will serve, but uh, so please see me after. Any questions I probably can't answer, but Katie probably can. Thank you very much. There will not be a test after on all these details. Just ask Sylvia because there's a lot to do. A couple other announcements. Uh, Adult Ed continues with uh, a second week of look at the narrative lectionary and that the United Sisters will be meeting at 10 a.m. Wednesday on September 26th, 22nd, this coming Wednesday. So all of you United Sisters, keep that in your mind. Um, and one more, uh, I think, very, very important, uh, bittersweet announcement. Uh, Chelsea Christ, our organist, is moving to Chicago with her fiancé who has a new job there. And so we have to say goodbye to Chelsea for the second time. And I know she's been an indelible part of the worship life of this congregation and we will be having a uh, celebration of her ministry here on the 24th of October would be her last Sunday. Uh, the, the Bordelais Ministries is, is currently beginning a search for a new organist, but we certainly want to um, enjoy the beautiful music that Chelsea has been providing this morning's in, uh, prelude and introduction music was just gorgeous. I just thank you very much, Chelsea. Let's give her a a little round of applause and appreciation. Okay, and then we've had one young lady anxiously and patiently waiting here. Amelia Reynoldson will be um, our faith reader for today as we uh, restart this practice. So, Amelia, come on up here and uh, we will hear about the second of the Ten Commandments, I believe. Is that right? We know who our God is. We also know how to get in touch with our God. We call God by name, and that's how God's name is to be used. This is the reason for the second commandment given by God to Moses and people who choose for his own. If you would please turn to the end of the order of service in your bulletin, and we will read the second commandment and its meaning together. You shall not take the name of the Lord of God in vain. What does this mean? We are to fear and love God so that we don't use his name to rise or use it to curse, swear, lie, save, but call upon in name and prayer to thank you. Thank you so much, Amelia. I invite you to rise in body or spirit and let's begin this worship with our confession and forgiveness. We begin worship in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And again, I'm going to move down to the font for where the journey of faith begins in the waters of baptism. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us, and for His sake, God forgives us all of our sins. 
as a called and ordained minister of the church of Jesus Christ and in his name alone and by his authority alone, I now declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's begin our worship with a song, O Day of Rest and Gladness, ELW 521. the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray together the prayer of the day. O God of promise, you stayed the hand of Abraham and fulfilled the promise you made to him that he would father a great nation. Keep your promises to us that we become inheritors of eternal life. Amen. You may be seated. The first lesson for the 17th Sunday after Pentecost is from Genesis chapter 21, verses 1 through 3, and chapter 22, verses 1 through 14. The Lord dealt with Sarah as he had said, and the Lord did for Sarah as he had promised. Sarah conceived and bore Abraham a son in his old age, at the time of which God had spoken to him. Abraham gave the name Isaac to his son, whom Sarah bore him. After these things, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, and he said, Here I am. He said, Take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah, and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains that I shall show you. 
So Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, and took two of his young men with him and his son Isaac. He cut the wood for the burnt offering and set out and went to the place in the distance that God had shown him. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place far away. Then Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey. The boy and I will go over there. We will worship, and then we will come back to you. Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on his son Isaac, and he himself carried the fire and the knife. So the two of them walked on together. Isaac said to his father Abraham, Father, and he said, Here I am, my son. He said, The fire and the wood are here, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? Abraham said, God himself will provide the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. So the two of them walked on together. When they came to the place that God had shown him, Abraham built an altar there and laid the wood in order. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to kill his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here I am. He said, Do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. And Abraham looked up and saw a ram caught in a thicket by its horns. Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called that place, the Lord will provide. As it is said to this day, on the mount of the Lord it shall be provided. The word of the Lord. I invite you to rise and body your spirit for the Holy Gospel according to John from the first chapter beginning with the 29th verse. Glory to you, O Lord. The next day he saw Jesus coming toward him and declared, Here is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who ranks ahead of me 
because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but I came baptizing with water for this reason, that he might be revealed to Israel. And John testified, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. I myself did not know him, but the one who sent me to baptize with water said to me, He on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain is the one who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I myself have seen and have testified that this is the Son of God. This is the Gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated. When I was younger, I must have been in seventh grade or so, my family bought this beautiful little green Suzuki dirt bike, 90 cc's of dirt. And we take it up to the Nebraska Panhandle and ride the Arroyos and the Badlands with my cousin Bruce and my Aunt Betty and their family and friends. And eventually, that, I got the bug and I got a more powerful bike, a wonderful 250 cc. And I spent many a fine day after school and on weekends popping through the sagebrush and climbing whatever small hills or gullies you could find around Keensburg, Colorado. Thank goodness I worked for a part-time for a farmer who had a couple wrecked cars in a pasture and I could go and climb those with my bike. Well, one spring after it had gotten warmer, my sister Kathy decided to get out that little bike and ride along with me. Now, this was her first time out. Uh, that year, I, of course, had been riding all winter and had grown quite fond and adept at drift busting uh, during winter blizzards, but now I was ready to get out and hit the dirt with my sister. So we headed just a few blocks away to this old bean dump, a big old building where they used to bring the beans and sort the, the dust from them before they put them on the railroad track. And there was this smallish hill, maybe 15 feet high, up to the building that brought you up into a landing right before the building itself. And I rode up and turned around to see my sister coming, and she was giving that little bike way more gas than she needed. It was her first time out, and she says, I'm not going to stall this thing on the hill and fall over. Well, she didn't stall. Instead, she launched about six feet into the air in the most pretty motocross-worthy arc. She landed gracefully, put one foot down and smashed right into the side of that darn building. Well, I ran over. She was sitting on the ground holding her wrist and as calm as the clear blue sky, she said to me, I'll go get mom and dad. I broke my arm. Well, I hopped on my bike. I flew down the hill and through the dirt streets of my town. We didn't have much pavement then. I got to our front yard, dropped the bike, leaped off, ran into the front room and I said, well, rather I yelled, Don't get excited, Kathy broke her arm at the bean dump. And then I turned around, hopped on my motorcycle, and headed back. I'm sure that it would have been helpful for my parents if I would have slowed down just a little bit. Maybe not yelled, maybe not run off like a a banshee. Perhaps we told the story in a slightly calmer way. Maybe even told it a couple of times, repeated it a couple of times so they could get this sense of what in heaven's name had happened. Instead, they must have been, well, I know they were, confused and startled and disconcerted about what had happened. I've been following, uh, I follow uh, a number of different sites online, Facebook and other sites, where pastors get together and they talk about the stories of the week. And I have heard a lot of confusion and disconcerting talk and disconcern about this story from Genesis 22. Because there's a lot to it, and a lot that's coming to you all at once. And it would be nice to slow down. There was a lot there. Dwayne read beautifully. But I think we need to recap just a little bit. So God keeps this big promise to Sarah. She gives birth to Isaac when Abraham is just a young 100 years old. And then we jump forward in the story, you know, an unspecified number of years, And God decides to test Abraham. Okay, take your son Isaac to Moriah and sacrifice him. So Abraham gets up early, takes two servants, some split wood, a donkey, 
his beloved son Isaac and sets out for Moriah. Three days later, he sees the mountain in the distance, tells the servants to stay with the donkey and says, the boy and I are going over there to worship. We'll be back. Abraham gives Isaac the wood. Abraham takes the flint and the knife and they set off. And as they walk along, Isaac says, Dad, we have some flint and wood, but where's the sheep for burning? Oh, God will see to it that there's a sheep for the burnt offering, Abraham says, as they continue to walk together. They reach the place. Abraham builds an altar. He lays out the wood. Then he ties his son Isaac up and lays him on the wood. And then he takes the knife out. Before anything else happens, this angel calls from heaven, Abraham, stop. Don't lay a hand on the boy. Don't touch him. Now I know you fearlessly fear God. You don't hesitate to place your own son, your dear son, on the altar for me. Abraham looks up and sees a ram caught in the thicket with its, by its horns and he sacrifices it instead of Isaac. And Abraham names the place God Yira, or God sees to it. There's no mention in this story about the awkward conversation that might have happened between Abraham and Isaac on the way back to the servants. But you have to wonder, at least I have to wonder in the midst of it all, what in the heck was Abraham thinking? What in the heck was God thinking? (laughs) And what in the world was poor Isaac thinking? And what kind of heartless test is this anyway? Please let me know, because if this is a test of faith, I'm going to drop the class. You know, sometimes we, sometimes when we are overwhelmed with difficult situations and difficult stories and difficult scripture, we want to find motivation for the actions of the characters. And that's human nature, and I can tell you that for the past few weeks, many of my colleagues and pastors following this narrative lectionary have been working overtime trying to just justify the actions of God and Abraham. Oh, perhaps God wanted to push Abraham as far as he could go and always along, all the way along, planned to bail him out. Or maybe it was just about the test and not about the result. Or maybe this isn't about Abraham as much as it is about God's ability to change. Maybe this is not about God at all, but a way to distinguish the Hebrew people from the surrounding cultures who did practice child sacrifice. Maybe this, maybe that, maybe, maybe, maybe. But in my experience, every time this story has come around and we preach to it, it has sparked sadness and grief and confusion and outrage. And for those who have experienced child violence, it can be a very, very terrible trigger. And for others, it can eat away at their very understanding of faith. How could anyone believe in such a hateful, uncaring, vicious God? Now last week we opened this year in the narrative lectionary in Genesis 1 and experienced how those words, that beautiful litany, opens the scriptures with this prayerful, worshipful vision of the vastness and magnificence of God's good creation. God brings life where there is none. And we celebrate God the creator, God the celestial life giver, God the bringer of joy. And yet now, just a few chapters in, we are presented with another image. Could God the life bringer also be God the life taker? And as I pondered that, it... it, 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 it occurred to me that maybe we need to hear it again, even more simplified. God tells Abraham to prepare to sacrifice his own son. That's pretty clear in the story. And when questioned by Isaac, Abraham says God will provide the sacrifice, and that's clear too. Then Abraham places Isaac on the sacrificial bier and raises his knife. And that's both clear and troubling to me. For at this part of the story, there seems to be no good option. If Abraham disobeys God, well, that's pretty bad. 
And if Abraham goes through with it, that's pretty terrible. But for me, the story itself gains clarity when the angel stops Abraham and Abraham sees the sheep stuck in the bushes. If you step back from all the details and all the terrible possibilities, you see that a new way appears when there seems to be no good way at all. So does that mean that God's changed? The story doesn't say so. The story doesn't say, well, God changed his mind and sent the angel. But if we, we really dig deeply into this arc of Genesis, this may be a point in the narrative, a point in the book where we are let in, we are let in and revealed a newer and broader understanding of the character and the power and the activity of God. Here at Isaac's beer, God is revealed to be broader, more beautiful, more truthful. Where there seems to be no good way forward, God will and does open a new way. And Abraham, what he does, in the face of it all, is to trust the God he knows. The God that he experienced throughout the story, the God of creation and promises, the God that brought about new birth from barren lives, who promised descendants as numerous as the stars in the heavens. And there's a key sentence in here that just kept rolling around in my mind. When questioned by Isaac, Abraham responds with words of trust. He says, God will provide a lamb, and God does. Now, our lives might not be at a point where we're, we only have two terrible and dismaying choices, but we know that the past year and a half haven't provided many good options for the challenges that we have arisen among us. And we also have to admit that when we have attempted to respond to the challenges of the future with the solutions of the past, we have also often ended up stuck and frozen, not able to take the next step, not willing to take the next step. Yesterday, we were finally, after 18 months, able to commend Daryl Anderson to God's loving care. 18 months. 18 months and the death of his two sons. And for most of that time, there were no real good options. Marie and her family and her friends, including those of you here at Cross and us here at Cross, we didn't have good options, but we trusted that God would open up a new option, and God did, and for that we are ever thankful. And as a congregation today, we look to a time when we know that our young families can feel safe to bring their children once again to in-person worship. It Frightens my day just to see the children that are here. I want to have a children's sermon. And I want to do that right away. But we don't know the challenges and the changes yet to come. We're still stuck in that no really good option phase. But as a people of faith, as a community of faith, we do have our shared faith in the promises of God. A faith that at its very root is centered in a trust that no matter what has been, what is, or what is to come, but that we can trust that God will bring about newness and hope and God's preferred future for each of us as persons, as a congregation, as a people, as a world. All I can say to that is, thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. So you talk about worship planning. Next hymn, If You But Trust in God to Guide You.
With the faithful gathered around the world at all times and in all places, I invite you to join in the confession of your faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, He rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Made children and heirs of God's promises, we now pray for the church, for the world, and for all in need. O God of creation, we pray for this hurting earth, awaking in us a new desire to care for the world and empower us to support agencies and organizations and individual efforts to heal our environment. Lord, in your mercy. O God of cooperation, we pray for nations of the world embroiled in conflict, inspired leaders to listen to each other and work toward peaceful solutions to disagreements. Protect the vulnerable, especially children who cannot find safety either in their home or country. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of healing, we pray for all who live with mental or physical illness. Help them find appropriate care. Bring healing and wholeness when the path forward seems bleak. Lord, in your mercy, God of compassion, we pray for the young people of this congregation. Renew in us your call to welcome the children in our midst. And as they grow, strengthen their faith and our commitment to them. Lord, in your mercy. God of community, we pray for the ministries of this congregation and our neighboring faith communities, especially our partners in the St. Paul area Synod, the congregation's which share our sanctuary, St. Paul Promesa de Dios and Iglesia Adventista del Septimo Dia, and the faithful communities which Pastor Amy serves at shores of Lake Phelan and Cardigan Ridge. Empower, empower faith communities throughout the world and encourage missionaries who walk beside global and local neighbors. Kindle in us a spirit of collaboration that all people may know your loving works. Lord, in your mercy. O oh God of comfort, you hear the prayers offered in the silence of our hearts are shared now for others to hear. Lord, in your mercy. Comforting God, you bring hope and love to those who mourn. We pray especially today for the families of Devin, Miros, and Elijah, young people whose lives have been cut short all too soon. Hold their families, friends, teachers, and neighbors in your care. We pray for the family of Daryl Anderson, whom we committed to your everlasting and loving care yesterday. Lord, in your mercy. And God of hope, we give thanks for the faithful departed who showed us how to honor God with our heart. Inspire us by their example and renew our faith, trusting that we will be united with them in glory. We remember Daryl and Sharon and Corrine, Jack and Dennis, Kevin, Todd, Florence, Bev, Phyllis, Dorothy, Pat, and Bridget. Lord, in your mercy. Receive these prayers, O God, and those in our hearts known only to you. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. You may be seated. We will now collect our offering.
Let the vineyards be fruitful, Lord, and fill to the brim our cup of blessing. Gather the harvest from the seeds that were sown, that we may be fed with the bread of life. Gather the hopes and dreams of all, unite them with the prayers we offer. Grace our table with your blessing And give us a foretaste of the feast to come Let us pray. Blessed are you, O God, maker of all things. Through your goodness you have blessed us with these gifts, ourselves, our time, and our possessions. Use us and what we have gathered in feeding the world with your love through the one who gave himself for us, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Now may the Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right, our great thanks, our great duty, our great joy, that we at all times and all places shall give thanks to God. The surprising God who opens up new opportunities when there, sees, when there seems none. The surprising and benevolent and loving God who gave His own Son for the sake of the world. So as we gather here today, we remember that on the night in which He was betrayed, I invite you to join me, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks, broke it and gave it to His disciples saying, Take and eat, this is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people, for the forgiveness of sins. Do this for the remembrance of me. We give you thanks, O God, for the presence of your Spirit here the Spirit who brings us together, the Spirit that gives us life, that Spirit who works through the waters of baptism and through the bread and the wine so that they will be and are for us the true body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ, as you promised, that new way forward into faith and life in eternity. All praise and honor and glory be to you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Now gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray together the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. You may be seated. Holy Communion at this church and in the ELCA is a gift of God for the people of God and all are invited to the table. If you have not received um, one of the communion packets on coming in, please raise your hand and our ushers will be sure to get one to you. Or if you have need assistance in opening the packets up, please let us know. Just raise your hand and we'll take care of that. All right. I invite you to take out the wafer. Take and eat. This is the body of Christ given for you. Amen. Return to the cup. 
Take and drink. This is the blood of Christ shed for you. Amen. Now may the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen and keep you in God's grace now and forever. Amen. And may the Lord bless us and keep us. May the Lord shine on us with mercy and grace. May the Lord look upon us with favor and grant us peace in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I invite you to rise for our sending Him to be your presence. Number 546. Go in peace, serve the Lord.